Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text upon which we base our meditation today is the Old Testament lesson on the second Sunday after Pentecost in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 22 and 23, and verses 41 to 43. Solomon has finished building, or with all the workers, finished building the temple. In all of its glory in Jerusalem, it's covered in gold leaf, the entire outside, so when the sun hits it, up on that mountain of Jerusalem, it's pretty impressive. He's now at the dedication where they've, as the Bible tells us, they offered so many sacrifices they lost count, trying to tell God how thankful they are and wanted to worship him in a proper way. And Solomon has this part, this is part of Solomon's prayer. And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of Israel, spread out his hands toward heaven and said, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants, who continue wholeheartedly in your way. As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when they come and pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your own people Israel, and may know that this house I have built bears your name. This is God's word. Dear friends, just a week and a half ago, Lynn and I took a three-day vacation, and we went and explored the Mount Rainier area. What's surprising about that is that's the first time in 38 years we've been there, and it's just up there. We've been out here for 38 years since we moved from Wisconsin, and and we've done all the stuff around Mount Hood. We've gone up the gorge. We've been out to the coast. We've been in Long Beach. We've been to Newport, Depot Bay, Crater Lake, all those things. And it was like, you know, we've never explored Mount Rainier. The closest we've seen Mount Rainier is when we're on I-5 going back and forth to Seattle. And you're at those rest stops and say, yep, that's another mountain. We know that mountain, and we know that mountain, and we know that mountain, and we know that mountain. But when you get close, I couldn't help but just simply say, it's big. It's really tall and big. Not just tall, but it's big. I thought about Mount Hood, because I always, always considered Mount Hood big. Remember, I grew up in Wisconsin. So as I'm at the base of Mount Hood at government camp and sitting in their lounge and looking up at Mount Hood, it's, it's big. And uh, I've never had the desire to climb it. I've had the desire to sit on that nice couch in the lounge at government camp or up at, at Timberline Lodge and say, that's a nice big mountain. Then when I'm sitting in a, on a porch or out at Paradise Lodge on a picnic table, and I'm looking up and said, you know, if you put Mount Hood here, Mount Rainier is like this. It's not just taller. It's just huger. It's bigger. And I still had no temptation to climb that thing. So my hat's off to those of you that have done it or even attempted to do it because I was glad to sit there on the porch at Longmire Lodge and hold a Mountain Dew and look at it. And consider how awesome and huge it is. And as I sat on that porch at the Longmire Lodge, which is just the southwest corner of the park, I mean, you're not even up at Paradise or even closer to it. You're just, it's framed in the trees. And this Longmire guy is a guy who came down from Yelm and started a mineral springs here to, to make, make a profit and uh, have a pride for li- pride to provide a living for his family. And I'm reading about him, and he says, it says at 63 years old, he climbed this mountain by himself. Still not tempted to beat him at 63-year-old myself. But I gave him a lot of credit and toasted him with my Mountain Dew to say, there, good for him. <laughs> I'm still sitting here on the porch and watching this. That's one little 
mountain on this entire planet. And our planet is one little planet in this solar system. And this solar system is one little solar system in this galaxy. And this galaxy is one of how many in this universe. How small and insignificant I felt in looking at all of that. When I looked at this text first at the beginning of this month and looked at these simple words of Solomon, and I knew it was on the bulletin cover this morning, the, the quote of it plus a little like airplane shot of mountains with clouds around. And he said, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant to love with your servants, who continue wholeheartedly in your way. That was a nice, pleasant statement and very simple. Okay. But to remind myself about how awesome that really is. And I think of the, the, the situation here and try and put it in the whole perspective of God who, I think, telling us in the beginning of the book of Genesis, he is the one responsible for creating this universe. He's the one responsible for creating all the galaxies and all the solar systems within those galaxies and putting together all those planets that are around those solar systems in all those galaxies. And then he took this one planet and put it just the right distance from its sun and tilted it on its axis so it would support us human beings. Now I'll tell you, as a child, I took that for granted. In fact, actually watching Star Trek through the 60s and Star Wars when those came out, there's planets all over the place have all these human beings on. They're, they're all over the place. And it's easy to have a class M planet all over the universe. All we have to do is figure out how to get around that speed of light thing so we can travel. So wormholes are necessary. <laughs> and a few other things that I love about science fiction. But I also know science fiction is different from reality. I mean, even as we're trying to figure out now how to get to Mars and the spaceships and reading about those, those twins that have been analyzed, one twin that went up to the space station to see what was gonna happen, his body compared to his twin brother who was here on Earth and realize space travel is not easy because those spaceships do not have gravity. In Star Trek and Star Wars, they have gravity. Everybody walks on the floors in those TV shows and movies. There's gravity everywhere. So how does it affect the human body? Because they make gravity. <laughs> Except, you know, when you ever watch one of those shows and all the systems are down, so the oxygen level has got a problem and uh, lights have a problem to begin with and all these other things, so they're in trouble. You notice they never float in the air like the gravity system failed to. No, I try and keep my science fiction separate from my reality. But that reminds me again about the difference about science fiction and who God really is. And that also reminds you, just as we celebrated Trinity Sunday, last Sunday, I don't understand or can comprehend who God really is or a God at all. Somebody that's been in existence from ever and decided to make this universe and decided to make this planet and decided to have a relationship with what he would call human beings and made Adam in that special way and even that special way and gave him wonder place and said, if you would just worship me by leaving this one tree alone, this will be awesome. And they messed up that relationship by eating the fruit thinking God was holding out, their life could have been better. That's how they were tempted and fooled by Satan. And they got kicked out of the garden. And then thinking about how God just simply wanted people to worship him like Abel did, and Cain kills him because he's jealous of the relationship that he had with God, and he wanted the same thing without the work or without the effort. And then you have the good kids of 
Adam and Eve and the bad kids of Adam and Eve, and eventually they get outnumbered, the good kids. And God says, enough, I'm going to start over. So Noah, I want you to build an ark. Your three sons, their wives, will start over. And there's that universal flood of where you can see evidence of it throughout this planet, like the Grand Canyon and a whole bunch of other places. But all the things that God did differently to get this earth so it's not looking like it was when he first made it. Which is why I laughed when people said when we first went into the Iraq war, because maybe we'll find the Garden of Eden. <laughs> uh, that got wiped out <laughs> by the flood. Uh, let's put it all together in God's work. And even after the flood, you would have thought those the kids and the grandkids and the great-grandkids and the great-great-grandkids would have thought, this is the right thing to do and don't do this. And yet they did. And so God finally comes to a man by the name of Abraham and says, you want to have a relationship with me? A lot of other people don't seem to want to have a relationship with me. You want to have a relationship with me? I want you to leave your family and your country, and I'll make you a great name. I'll protect you. I will bless you. And eventually that Messiah that I promised back to Adam and Eve, and I promised again to Noah and his family, it's going to come through your family and all the nations of the world will be blessed. Go outside, Abraham, and look at the stars. Count them if you can. And that's when you try and count them from Mount Rainier, not when you count them from here. That's your descendants. And yet at the same time, when God called Abraham at 75, he still did not have a son of his own with Sarah. And even by 90, he still did not have a son with Sarah. And so they tried the surrogate mother program and found that isn't really how God wanted us to do it. It wasn't terribly wrong, but that wasn't the method to get a son. God finally blessed them when he was nine, 100 and gave him that son that we know by the name of Isaac. And then to think of what happened next with that is that God gave a test to Abraham. He told him, I want you to sacrifice that son. I'll tell you where to go. Go leave your family. Uh, go to the area of Moriah. And I'm going to ask you to sacrifice your son. Now the Bible doesn't tell us, but maybe you want to take a guess. Do you think he told his wife what he's going to do next? Uh, God came to me last night and told me we're supposed to kill Isaac. And so we're going to go off. I'm going to kill Isaac. I'll be home later. My educated guess is he didn't say a word to Sarah. But he did what God wanted him to do, as the Bible does tell us. And as he and Isaac were walking up that mountain, Isaac asked those obvious questions because he worshipped with God before. This was part of the family deal. We've got the fire, we've got wood, uh, where is the sacrifice? And Abraham simply said at that moment, God will provide. And he built a pile of rocks, and he put the wood on it. And then he grabbed Isaac to put him on that, and was about to sacrifice him when God interfered. Now when I think again of that sacrifice, I realize Abraham had an awesome faith. Isaac, I think, had an awesome faith, too. Because if he's a teenager, how's Dad going to tie him up and get him on top of that pile of rocks without some cooperation? Michael, you think you could fight Grandpa enough there that if he was going to tie you up and put you on top of a pile of rocks, you wouldn't be able to figure out a way to get off of that? So Isaac also must have had a tremendous faith in something like that to allow that to happen when God stopped him and said, I know, but that's sort of a what we call an anthropomorphism. God knew what Abraham was going to do. This test wasn't for God to figure out what Abraham was going to do or how he was going to succeed or not succeed. This was a test for Abraham to help Abraham understand, hey, I do have an awesome faith. Though I love my son, God helped me understand I love him more. And he gave me a chance to prove that. He gave me a chance to believe that. And so we have the beginning of the patriarchs with Abraham, and then Isaac, and then Jacob. But then the Bible fleshes out this story some more and reminds us again that Jacob with his 13 kids, because he had those four wives, and started not following everything the way God wanted them to do. And they started; those kids started intermarrying with the local gals, and they were pulling them away from the true worship of the true God, that God knew we got to do this, so do something about this. I promise not to have a flood again. So he gets them to move down to Egypt because of the famine. 
And that clan of 70, 400 years later, becomes the two million Israelites that are now in slavery by the Egyptians, and God uses Moses to get them out and head them back to the promised land and then set up their society and set up their government at Mount Sinai because it's not just the Ten Commandments. It's all, it's all the laws that are there in Numbers and Leviticus. And we can also read them in Deuteronomy. And he sets up this society and he gets them back to what he told Abraham to begin with. That promised land is going to be all your kids. That two million people certainly was a start of all the stars that Abraham could have seen in the universe. And they deal with their tribes and their clans, and eventually they get some kings. And the first king, Saul, didn't turn out too well because power went to his head. David also was a pretty good king. Once in a while, power went to his head. Solomon becomes a good king, and he knew, power is going to go to my head. And it did happen once in a while. But Solomon at least was able to build this temple. Now what puts this picture together again is where he builds this temple and where the Ark of the Covenant ends up. The exact same spot where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac 800 years, 400 years before. Now 800 years before, because we got Abraham to Moses 400, Moses to Solomon 400. And the blessing that God gave that temple that Solomon built, that lasts 400 years before, again, the Israelites mess up and God allowed the Babylonians to come in to destroy it. But for 400 years, that temple stood. And, Ab and Solomon was able to have this prayer of dedication. Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. And that same pillar of fire, pillar of cloud that was with the Israelites when Moses was going through the Israelites, the wilderness with the people that led them for those 40 years, it shows up at this dedication and fills the holy place and the most holy place. So God, were able, God showed the people, Solomon is not just doing this on his own, I'm working with him. So listen to what he has to say. Now, in our text today, we're missing on the back of the bulletin, verses 24 all the way through 40, Solomon's prayer for himself and the people. And I'm not going to read that whole thing to you, but simply summarize. The first thing he talks about is, you promised my father David that we and a descendant of his would always be on the throne if we listened to you. Solomon's prayer, help me listen to you. And when I don't, or my kids don't, or my grandkids don't, help them to come back in repentance and apologize. And I ask that you do what you normally do, and that is forgive us when we repent. Then when the people lose a battle, it'll only because it'll only because be because we did something wrong. Because you promised to always be with us. So if we lose a battle, help us to come back and repent. And we ask you to forgive us. If we have a drought and famine. That will only happen because we haven't listened. Help us to come back to repent and apologize and ask for forgiveness. If we have disease and a plague, it will only happen because we haven't listened. Help us come back and repent. And again, please forgive us. And then he gets to the part where he asks for help for other people too. As for the foreigner, which is in our text today, who does not belong to your people, Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When they come and pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your own people, and may know that this house I have built bears your name. I need to remind myself from time to time how big and huge and awesome God is. And so, yes, looking at some parts of his creation, whether that be like a crater lake or a Mount Rainier or even a blown up Mount St. Helens, and then put that in perspective of how much bigger he is. And yet, he knows who I am. 
and he cares about me. Insignificant me. He cares about me, he knows about me, and he wants to have a relationship with me. And he wants those same things with you. He knows who you are, he cares about you, he wants to have a relationship with you. The question all human beings eventually get to is, do we want to have a relationship with him? Do we want to listen to him? Do we want to worship him? Do we want to have a relationship with him? Or sometimes do we just want him as a magic genie, we rub our hands together in prayer and give me stuff, and then when we don't need him, we put him back on the shelf. Solomon asked for help with the basic things in their lives, but also that their relationship with God would stand in as an example that other people would want it too. I need to read. I need to dwell on parts of God's Word. Because if I should and can get inspired and toast a mountain with a Mountain Dew, a simple cross, a simple wafer, a simple cup of wine. To remind myself, those aren't simple things. They are simple in a way, but Christ's body and blood for the forgiveness of my sins, so I get to live in heaven for eternity. That's huge. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.